the more you do that, the more you get out there, the more people know who you are, the mm -hmm. more eyes that see your website, mm -hmm. you know, the more people who contact you. It, it's, it's, it's one of those domino effects. Right. right. That's, a, that's awesome. Now, yeah. So the key is get a retrospective at a museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put that it's on my to-do list. Yeah. Welcome to Waiting to Dry, the only art podcast who makes their listeners make their own merch, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll fix that one of these days. <laughs> so uh, my name's Sergio Lopez. I'm Josh Lawyer. And we have Fernando Reyes on the podcast today. Awesome. Right. Hey, guys. Thank hey. you so much for doing this. <laughs> yeah. Excited. Uh, uh, yeah. The, um, for those of you that don't know his work, um, you do, well, it's hard to explain because you're kind of... All over the place? See, all over the place is a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you seem to uh, um, dip your feet into a lot of different uh, puddles or whatever. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, how, how did that come to be, I guess, start there? Well, you know, I've been, I've been doing my art full time since, um, well, I guess, 90, early 90s. Wow. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but I wasn't making money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was a banker actually for many years mm -hmm. oh, before huh. I started my art career, wow. uh, working with, um, uh, well, I don't want to name the bank, but for 17 years I was a banker mm. and, uh, decided to quit mm -hmm. 1991. How was that? Incredible. Yeah. It was absolutely incredible. Yeah. I, um, I left a job <clears throat> where I had, uh, a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in, um, sort of mid. Uh, level management mm -hmm. uh, and managed a, a very large portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, left that and uh, I knew I wanted to start my art career uh, that uh, uh, th that I knew <laughs> it wasn't something e it wasn't going to be something easy for me to do mm -hmm. um, and that I really had to sort of figure all this out. Now, it did take me at least about a year and a half to make that decision. So right. basically get myself out of debt, mm -hmm. save myself a ton of money yeah. mm -hmm. and lived on that for a while. Mm -hmm. um, ended up going to school in uh, 93 mm -hmm. um, when I uh, moved to Chicago Okay, okay. Uh, to go to the Art Institute. So All right. where were you banking? Where were you in, in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah, mostly, mostly in San Francisco, okay. about 17 years. Okay. okay. Yeah, right. yeah. I started very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a long time ago. <laughs> APG, APG and Ninny was still around. So that'll tell you what bank. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, anyway, I, I quit my job in 1991. And uh, one of the reasons why I quit my job was my partner at the time, uh, who is now my husband, mm -hmm. um, uh, had quit his corporate job and decided huh. to go back to school full time. And I saw what oh, wow. he was doing. Oh, and I wow. thought, you know... <laughs> Yeah, I was I was just really stressed with what I, with with the position that I had uh, in banking, and I thought, you know, I could do that. I, you know, I haven't failed yet. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, there's no way I'm going to fail going into another career. Although I know it's going to be difficult, and it was difficult working at uh, working at the bank as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that tested my limits, and I thought, well, let me try this. Mm -hmm. I really and I really wanted to be an artist for the longest time, even okay. you know, while I was when I was a kid uh -huh. growing up. Mm -hmm. Um. So I, I made the break. You know, I quit, and uh, I did take some classes at City College over at uh, the Fort Mason uh, campus, mm -hmm. uh, basically figure drawing mm -hmm. and uh, printmaking. Okay. And in 1993, I moved to Chicago, not because, um, not because I was applying to the Art Institute. I moved to Chicago because my partner, Daniel at the time, uh, got accepted to Paul University for graduate school. Okay. So there was nothing keeping me in in San Francisco. Right. And so we moved. Nice. And uh, one day I was out doing a run around uh, Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. And well, not around Lake Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Along <laughs> Lake Michigan. Long run, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I saw this uh, posting uh, for an open portfolio day at the Art Institute of Chicago. Mm. 
now this so this is how green I was back then, not knowing really much about art. I didn't know what the Art Institute of Chicago was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew it was a school, but I had no idea of its stature, you know, in the art world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went and I applied, and it seemed like you know uh, all of the Midwest kids were there applying as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I waited in line, got finally got to the uh, front, and um, and got accepted. Wow. With uh, a portfolio of works that were basically drawings. Mm-hmm. Wow. I didn't really have much, uh, except for drawings with some watercolor washes. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I was also doing um, stippling work. Okay. You know that? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was doing a lot of stippling work back then. And mm. uh, it was very tedious, but I I thought it was really cool. And I thought, well, this is, you know, I'll just go with this and see what they think. And so got accepted. And uh, I started in 1994, the spring of 94. And, nice. Nice. Uh, did it in three years. It is kind of cool whenever um, we, we've I've heard it a good amount where artists naively go to something that they're they have no idea what they're getting themselves into, <laughs> and that like naivety is like what allows them to like get past the doubt of you know uh, trying you know. Mm-hmm. Which I I don't know for a lot of artists it seems like a big f- flaw is like oh I'm not ready for this or I mm-hmm. I'm not qualified for that uh, so that yeah. is interesting you right know? yeah no that's 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 true um, you know but I really at the at that time I really had no other choices you mm-hmm. know I and this mm. happened to come upon me and I I just went for it for and, sure and I'm glad that I did because yeah. I'll tell you it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me in my life at that time that's awesome yeah. Wow. Nice. Yeah. So, pro art school. <laughs> pro art school. Yeah. Yes. It's a common uh, BFA. conversation. BFA. <laughs> oh, I, I, I just tally to the yeah. score. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's awesome. So, so you went to school, and that's kind of where you. When you went to school, was that kind of where you just learned? I'm not super familiar with schooling in general. I I was a self. I'm a self taught artist. So. Mm-hmm that school in general where they kind of focused on the the um you know the fundamentals or were they more um yeah they, they were um i i just knew how to draw mm-hmm. i didn't uh-huh. know how to paint mm-hmm. <laughs> although i did take a class in uh, oil painting it was um an intermediate class mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't want to go into the beginner's class. I just figured oh well you know <laughs> i'm beyond that <laughs> yeah. yeah but i wasn't <laughs> and i was I was immediately tagged by the instructor, a professor, who came up to me one day and looked at my painting next to me, and he just said, you don't know how to paint, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's humbling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, that was an awakening, and he said, uh, next time I come back in another, on another day, you better learn how to paint. You better know a little bit more of what you're doing. Wow. Uh, so I had, to, I had to learn real quick. Huh. I had to speed it up real quick. And, uh, and I did. Wow. I, did. It was, and, I mean, that's just one, you know, one yeah. situation. But yeah, I have many. So what taught you then? Like, how did you go about learning, learning. yourself? Yeah. Learning? Uh, well, at the time, books. Okay. Uh, you know, not, there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, <clears throat> computer. I mean, there was some. Uh-huh. Um, art history. You know, okay. yeah. uh, you know, learning about the masters, how they mm-hmm. painted. Mm-hmm. And that was sort of the direction I was looking at anyway when I was going to art school, although that wasn't really what you were being taught. You mm-hmm. know, there was really much more contemporary work okay. back then. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I had to, um, when drawing the figure, which is really my focus, um, I was, I seemed to be very tight, you know, in mm-hmm. drawing the figure. And uh, again, in, in figure drawing, my instructors would come up to me and, you know, sort of like slap you on the, on the hands. Not <laughs> really, but, you know, sort of like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like a tongue lashing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have to loosen up. Right. You know, and you've got to draw larger. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a number of things, you know, while going to art school, you learn uh, that art, uh, there's, there's a different way of looking and doing art as opposed to just sitting there and just drawing from a magazine mm-hmm. of the figure or, you know, of, of, from photographs. Right. Yeah. You're drawing from life, and that's mm-hmm. a different way of looking. Right. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the things that I was taught. In painting, I would, you know, I would uh, reference my friends, you know, mm-hmm. friends that I'd make, you know, that I made there at school and see what they were doing, you For know, sure. and, and uh, just learn, just learn very quickly. So I learned just enough. <laughs> so the next time he came by, he said, that's great. He said, just keep going. 
that's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, nice. So then you you went to school, and I'm. I mean, what led you back this direction? Well, um, so Daniel also graduated in 1997 from mm-hmm. DePaul University with his master's, and um, the intent was to come back to the Bay Area anyway at some okay. point. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Although I love Chicago. Chicago is a great school, a great place to mm-hmm. live. Uh, and it's a great school as, as well. Mm. Uh, but the intent was to come back, and so we did. And we moved to Davis for one year, and uh, I started painting uh, landscapes. Okay. Oh, wow. mm. Yeah, if you know Davis, a lot of farmland out there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So uh, there wasn't a whole lot of figure work for me to work from because I didn't really know the area, and I didn't know much of anybody in, mm-hmm. in, that, in, uh, in Davis. But, you know, they have a great university there, mm-hmm. uh, UC Davis. Right. And, uh, Aggies or whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so uh, two things there um, regarding the landscape painting. Because I didn't have a model to paint from, uh, I started painting in plein air. Hmm. I just you would – I bought a bike, and I would just go out in my bike or my truck – and uh, set myself up and just start painting landscapes. Nice. And the and I never really painted landscapes. And I thought, well, I'll just use the same approach as painting the figure. Mm-hmm. You know, you're painting from life. And so that was the idea of um, uh, or my way of going out and uh, sort of figuring out, you know, well, I've seen what uh, plein air paintings look like. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm going to try to do replicate but in my own way in my yeah. own style in the way i've been taught how to paint mm-hmm. yeah that's basically how i started with my plein air painting yeah. work as well because i went to school mostly um studied the figure and didn't take any landscape painting classes there so when it came time to be like oh not i don't have access to the models nearly as easily as i did in school then what else am i going to paint from life well the rest of the world then that's right yeah, that's right. yeah. <laughs> i mean still life is another thing but you know you yeah. stay in, you're indoors but this is you know going outdoors and that was a lot of fun mm-hmm. that was a lot of fun the other thing is uh, i was also well two two things i was focusing on when i was at the art institute was uh the figure and drawing and painting and uh, printmaking okay yeah so and you didn't really um while going to school uh and go for a BFA, you didn't really uh, go for any particular, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, a de- well, you go for the degree of BFA, but you don't, uh, you're not really applying for a particular right, like degree a in, a, in a particular medium. Right. Okay. Um, so, but, but the way I looked at it is painting and drawing from the figure was really what I was more focused with, and uh, printmaking was secondary. Mm-hmm. So, UC Davis, I knew they had a printmaking shop. In fact, a very good, uh, very well-known printmaking shop there as well. And I thought, well, I'll just go over there and introduce myself and see if there's any way I could maybe, you know, right. get in there somehow, maybe be able to use their presses. And right. and I did. I got to meet the department chair and showed her my portfolio. And she liked what she saw. And she said, you know, you can come in and... Uh, print and use our presses uh, if you will come in and sort of be like a TA to my students. Mm. I said, perfect. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. And she gave me the keys and says, you can come anytime you want. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that worked out really well. But that was short-lived. All mm-hmm. that was just just a year. Mm. Uh, and then we moved uh, to back to the Bay Area right. and tried to move back into San Francisco. And this, so this is 1998. Okay. Um, the dot-com was just starting. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Housing was going crazy right Uh, rentals were just everyone was trying to find a place to live in san francisco and Mm -hmm. it was extremely expensive we couldn't live in san francisco anymore because i mean basically we were both really out of school Mm -hmm. and we weren't making a whole lot of money right yeah you know so uh and also uh daniel was doing his internship at uc davis okay that's the reason why we lived in davis okay okay Okay. 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 (laughs) yeah so anyway 1998 uh moved to oakland Okay. Yeah, and I've been here ever since. Nice. In 1999, I opened my studio here at Fort Street Studios, and this is where I've been all this time. That's awesome. Yeah. So it sounds like you almost went a traditional painter route in college and kind of a little bit after. So then if you look at your work now, there's so much more of an abstraction to your work, so much more of like almost like an illustrative look to your work 
you know, attention to like the line work is very, seemed very important in your work. So how did that go from like maybe painting, um, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a plain air and, uh, I don't know if you were classically paint, like trying to traditionally paint figures or if you always kind of had a, a love for line work and stuff like that. And no, it's always been mostly the line work. Mm-hmm. Uh, no. And I haven't been classically trained. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think about that. Um, I thought at one point that I should know how to draw and paint the figure mm-hmm. in a classical style. Um, but that certainly wasn't the Art Institute of Chicago. Okay. You know, you didn't, you just didn't do that. Right. Yeah, not there. Um, and so that wasn't the direction I was focused on. I was okay. really more focused on being very loose with the, uh, with the tools that I was working with, both mm-hmm. in the, um, in, in charcoal or Conte uh, or in the brush. You know, so what you're seeing in my studio right now is mm-hmm. not the way I was painting in art school. In art school, I was taught to paint the figure in a very contemporary way, but contemporary uh, being, um, I don't know, uh, with a loose, loose brush. Um, something. Okay, so some of the artists that I was looking at back then uh, were artists like Lucian Freud. Okay. Mm. Uh, you know how juicy his work was. You know, mm-hmm. this brush stroke. He just loaded his brushes. Um, but then to the other extreme, I would also look at, um, I would look at Paul Cadmus. You know, and, okay. you know, look at his, you know, look at his drawings. His drawings are absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. So I was looking at a lot of different artists at the time and uh, really, I didn't have a voice back then. You know, I was really, and nobody does really when you're in art school. You <laughs> right. really don't. You know, uh-huh. uh, you you're learning think the basics. You do, though. <laughs> oh, well, a lot of the a, a lot of the kids. Well, I say kids because they were kids to me when I was there. I was right. already yeah, going yeah. on forty when I graduated <laughs> from art when I graduated from art school. So, huh. um, yes, you're right. And uh, but I knew better. <laughs> you know, coming from a corporate world, you know, mm-hmm. you just uh, you don't go in thinking that you know you're on the top top of the world. Maybe right. while well, you're at art school, yeah, that's fine. But when you're in the real world, that's a different story. Right. right? Yeah, but. Uh, uh, no, so I, I've gone through an, 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 this whole process of uh, working with the figure, both in drawing and painting, to get to where I'm at today. Um, all these different stages. Um, I, I showed you earlier uh, some of the figure paintings that uh, that mm-hmm. I was doing, the type of work I was doing. Another one, uh, one of the first ones that I did back in 2002, is uh, is very linear. Right. Yeah. And uh, and it, uh, it I, I'm focusing on just uh, a lot of shapes and color, right? Yeah, as well. Something like that comes from my drawings, hmm. uh, and it comes from my drawings in a way that uh, uh, w- when you're in a figure drawing session, uh, at least for me back early on, uh, I was, you know, although I may have had some money set to set aside to live on mm-hmm. I had to make sure I had enough to keep me going. Right. But I also had to buy supplies, right. you know? And so when I would go to a figure drawing class, you know, I try to economize with the paper that I was working with and mm. uh, figured, well, I can't put just one figure on a piece of paper because I'm, I'm using up the paper so quickly. Right. <laughs> so I started drawing more than one figure on a piece of paper. And mm. then as I was doing that, I realized there's something really interesting about this because there's some abstraction going on here, which I, which was not intentional. Right. You know, I was just trying to be ec- economical. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I think one of my very first early sales was actually one of those drawings uh, mm. by someone who had uh, come to my studio here early on, very early on, and saw one of these drawings and was just amazed. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. <clears throat> I said, maybe I have something here. So that's what sort of got me started with working with the figure in both a what I would consider to be representational, linear right. way and uh, abstract way. Huh. The abstraction mm-hmm. comes from the way the figures are overlapping mm-hmm. each other. Yeah. So you have these shapes that are being created based on that. Right. Mm-hmm. That's cool. So how do you determine the the colors that you put in, in your pieces? Um, well, in the, in the very beginning, when I started doing this process, uh, I pretty much stayed with cool colors, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so the blues and grays, uh, which is what I showed you earlier. Mm-hmm. And um, again, another another 
collector actually uh, early on who bought one of my early pieces says, you know, I'd really be interested to see what you do with color with these. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, I should have thought of that myself, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, I mean, this, this is how things happen. For you sure. Know? Uh -huh. People talk to you and you, they give you ideas and, yeah. and exactly, that's exactly yeah. what happened. And, and then all of a sudden all this color started bursting out of my palette, you mm -hmm. know, onto my canvases and onto my panels and, right. and so forth. And, uh, uh, so the figure was something that I've been working on for many, many years. Uh, <clears throat> and then also the abstraction mm -hmm. that goes along with it, you know, right. as a result of the way I, I work with the figure. I also work with the single figure as well. So it's not as abstract at all, mm -hmm. but, uh, but this other style was something that I sort of created on my own and, um, and it has been successful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't say that I was making a living doing it, mm -hmm. uh, but I was making money. Okay. Um, uh, but, uh, and I always thought that as an artist, you know, it's always great to keep your work fresh. Okay. You know, don't do the same thing over and over and over again because sure. you'll lose the interest from your collectors. Mm -hmm. You'll gain new people that haven't seen your work before, yes. But, right. uh, um, you know, I just saw, I have this, this, this thing about, you know, wanting to keep fresh and uh, wanting to keep up to date, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm an older artist now. So, you know, my competition is younger artists right. who, are dare you, Sir Joe. Extremely, <laughs> who are extremely good. And I've seen mm -hmm. your work, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, who are extremely good, uh, but they do something totally different than I do. Right. You know, and, yeah. and that, that's the thing, is that's the key. Yeah. You know, I, I'm doing something completely different than than what anybody else is doing, at least that I know of. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely think looking at your work before meeting you, it definitely feels like something like new or young. It doesn't seem like, uh, you know, I'm not trying to call you old, but like... <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. I'm no, just I'm saying, not, like, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not that old. It, it, <laughs> it, it, uh, there is some, like, you know, aspect of it where if I, someone told me it was someone that was, like, in their, I don't know, early 30s or something, I don't know how young I start respecting artists are. But <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're digging yourself deeper in a hole here. Yeah, yeah, I do that a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, uh, I don't know. I'm just trying to say that there is this like freshness to it that, uh, especially like your willingness to use the colors is, uh, like you definitely didn't steer away from color, which is great. Like, uh, and going back to what you were saying earlier, where you had that suggestion from a collector, that is one good thing about like, you know, being open as an artist is, seems to be a very crucial thing to growing as an artist as well. You might get a hundred bad ideas doing that, but being able to like nitpick the good ones is always a great, um, yeah. You know, um, it's important to listen, mm -hmm. listen to what you don't have to listen to everybody, but right. you know, there's sometimes certain people that, know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't generally go to critiques or have critiques done of my work. Right. Uh, but, well, Daniel is probably my biggest critic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he pisses the hell out of me sometimes. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, <laughs> but what pisses the hell out of me even more is that he's right, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, my wife's probably yeah. nodding her head right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm her harshest. Sometimes I'm very mean to her as far as artwork is concerned. Okay, so we can relate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but then there are times when I'm not done with a piece and he'll already have something to say. And I mm -hmm. said, don't even. I said, it's not done. <laughs> Let me finish uh, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very very similar to my relationship it sounds like <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh but uh but good direction he's got a good eye that's like that's awesome have to say yeah, yeah that's really cool yeah. Yeah. and he's not an artist mm. yeah. so so you so you started with these uh these clusters of figures kind of in this abstracted way and it seems like you also had like where you've done like these paper cut abstractions and these um and um, these like paint glob, like almost like scales and uh, all these different other <laughs> like avenues you're kind of exploring. Yeah. 
when you're when you're kind of doing that as an artist, is there any fear attached to that, or is there? No. Is there? How, no. How, no. no <laughs> nice. I have no. I no. I'm I'm ready for any challenge. So what you're talking about, um, the uh, well, the abstract, figurative abstract clusters of figures mm-hmm. is the direction that I've been going for for quite a while, mm-hmm. and in 2000. 12, 13, I just thought, you know, it's time to change. Mm-hmm. I need to think about a different direction with this. And, you know, where can I go from here? Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I want to keep my voice. Right. I don't want to lose that. You mm-hmm. know, I want people to at least continue to follow what I'm doing and now see something different, see something mm-hmm. fresh. Probably more like 2014. Uh, so then I started thinking, well, what can I do to this? I started doing work where I was removing the line. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. I removed the line and just kept, kept the shapes mm-hmm. of the figure and still maintaining somewhat of a representational aspect, right. but mm-hmm. more, more abstract than before. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that, th- was, that was one, that was the next step. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you'll see some of those. Yeah, you'll see that on my website. You'll also see, see some of the early works. Some, not a lot, but some of the early works on my website as well. So when you when you kind of went that direction, was it like, like did it make you feel like you had? Because for me, um, whenever I do a big jump as far as what I'm doing, it's always like this refreshing, almost like the learning curve is the most pleasurable part. Right. of art for me in a weird way. So th- the more lost I am or the more uh, kind of like, wh- where am I, where is this going? The more like excited I am about my work. Do you find that with your Oh, stuff? I definitely do. So, oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So you also referenced, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the figure in paper cutouts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right, right. So that's another story altogether. And that happened by accident <laughs> that w- and it was a great accident so uh, this was in 2015 yeah 2015 or 2016 um i went to new york mm-hmm. uh and i went to new york because i wanted to see the egon sheila portraits mm-hmm. exhibition mm-hmm. at the new a gallery well at the same time and i didn't know this at the same time the matisse uh cutout show was happening at the moma mm-hmm. hmm. So I went to see that too. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I'm, I was never really a big Matisse fan mm-hmm. at all. I'm a huge Matisse fan now, mm-hmm. but I was huh. never a Matisse fan then, uh, back then. When I went to the exhibition, I was completely blown away when I walked into one of the galleries, a large gallery that housed, I think there were, the f- there were five of his large blue nude paper cutouts Mm -hmm. framed. They were so amazing. I just had to stand there in the middle and just take it all in Mm. thinking to myself, these are amazing. These are just so phenomenal that it just hit me. Something was hitting me at the time saying, take this in, take this back with you. You know, we all learn from other artists. For sure. All of us do. Nobody's inventing anything. Mm -hmm. Well, except for maybe digital, but and Sergio and Sergio, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so when um, when I came back from that trip, I had two shows that I had to get ready for, two solo shows, and uh, they were figurative shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was at the SF MoMA Artist Gallery, and the other one uh, was at Mercury Twenty mm-hmm. Gallery here in Oakland. Uh, and the first one was the. Um, uh, the SF MoMA Artist Gallery, which was sort of mid-year. So I had about six months to get work together. And I thought, you know, I'm a printmaker. He painted his paper. You know, he had a method of getting his paper toned, painted, whatever, right. to create his art, to cut them and create his art. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm a printmaker. I could do the same thing, mm. but I'll make prints. I'll make prints. I'll do my own color. I'll do my own designs. And I'll take that as my inventory and start cutting away. And that's exactly what I did. Hmm. Uh, so that first year um, that I had that, sh- uh, that I showed uh, paper cutouts, I only was able to do three or uh, four. 
uh, mm -hmm. for my exhibition because I didn't have enough time to do a full show. Right. And uh, when I put them out in the first exhibition, people went crazy for them. They didn't buy them, but they went crazy for them. <laughs> yeah. But it didn't make any difference because somebody else bought the entire. They were there was it was a it was a a triptych, mm -hmm. and uh, and it was an homage to Matisse's blue nudes. Mm -hmm. I did my own blue nudes, mm -hmm. so I I printed my own paper in all different hues of blue values huh. and, and so forth with designs. All I right. would use my woodblock prints, or my wood blocks. I'm sorry, and print on those and then cut them up mm. uh and uh, and then create these images on on uh, on panel individual images on panel so there's three of them and you'll see those on my website uh so those are my very first uh my first uh, paper cutouts those are three feet by four feet each and uh and that was a hit so uh when my next show at mercury 20 happened later in the year i was able to add one more uh paper cutout to that uh, collection because the rest were print works and paintings um again same thing i got the same kind of response so the following year i had an entire show of all paper cutouts and uh we have one right here in the studio oh. that i'm showing although it's my my paper that i printed and uh, cut along with some Japanese uh, screen print printed paper that I brought back from Japan oh, okay. uh, back in 2015. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so that piece is dated 2016. That's awesome. That's a, that's, that's seems like a ton of work. It is. Uh, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's fun. Yeah. There is something as far as block printing, there is something I really enjoy about it where, there is like a much more, it seems like a much more physical aspect to creating a, you know, a painting or whatever, or a print. Uh, and, uh, you know, like um, with with artists in general, there's like this, there's this love for mark making. Right. And I always found it interesting that um, with print, with block, block prints and all that, your mark making is like the negative space in the print. It, we're when we're looking at your block prints, we see where you didn't touch, or you know, it, right. there's this cool thing about that. That um, you know, and uh, I don't know. There's this. We've had this discussion before on the podcast about trying to grow value for art in general, like you know, making art more valuable. <clears throat> and w one thing I always kind of circle around is the craftsmanship of art mm -hmm. uh i think at some point was kind of disregarded or not as res highly respected as i think it should be and i think there is something craftsmanship about block cutting that people almost instantly i think understand where applying paint to a canvas isn't as maybe physical laborious or whatever that that people don't um seem to uh yeah, seem to, I don't know, uh, put as in, in the same category as as craftsmanship. You know, yeah. There's a the process is obviously different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it's physical. Mm -hmm. It's physical painting as well, depending on how large you paint. Right. You know? mm -hmm. But in terms of printmaking, and uh, I generally like to work in uh, woodblock, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, uh, there's that physical aspect of mm -hmm. sitting there and cutting into the wood. Mm -hmm. Not only is it physical, it's also for me, it's also very meditative. Mm -hmm. I can just zone out okay, and just cut away and right. just the feel of it. Just, I, I love that. Um, and uh, the best part is when I'm ready to print that to me is, is the delight. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the first delights of, uh, you know, of doing this mm -hmm. uh, because because you think you know what you're going to get, you know, mm -hmm. you think you know what you're going to see when you print it and it, uh, you get, you come with these surprises that huh. you didn't expect, you know, these beautiful cuts, these beautiful shapes happening. Right. I tend to, um, I tend to keep a lot of line work in my printmaking. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, this goes back to my drawings of the figure, right. you know, mm -hmm. um, in, in a lot of my early print working was basically all figure mm -hmm. as well. And uh, so there's that aspect of the physicality 
the the mental part of it and then the physical part of actually printing the work and mm -hmm. the surprise right you know and then you decide at that point you know well is it done or do i need to go back in there and do more okay so that's very that's very uh simplistic but yet you know i tend to go a little bit further because i like to add color so what does that right. mean? well I, that means i've got to do more blocks right, right? uh and that's a lot of fun because mm -hmm. um i'm into color i'm into the challenges and I make a lot of mistakes, but now because I'm doing all these paper cutouts, these mistakes are now my inventory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can actually wow. work. I can actually do something with these prints. Right. You know, at one point I had I had stacks of prints that I couldn't do anything with because there were problems with them. Right. But there was parts of those prints that were perfectly fine, mm -hmm. and I would use those to cut and do my cutouts. So that was before I actually started doing my own inventory mm -hmm. of color and different uh, patterns and so forth uh, for my current cutouts now. That's awesome. That's a crazy idea of creating artwork and then it failing and then using it to create more artwork. <laughs> well, it's, 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 yeah, it's about uh, not wasting money. For sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know? yeah. Uh, and, and it, this goes back to something else you had talked about. You know, you talked about the sort of the dollops of the paint mm -hmm. that I create. Mm -hmm. So, so that, uh, that all came about, oh God, I think the first one I did was 2002. Uh, I, I had, I have an old, a whole series of those, although most of them are gone now. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had an open studio years ago and, uh, I had a couple of them just sort of hanging around in my studio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this person came in and to my studio and said, well, what's that? And I said, oh, it's just paint that, you know, I'm not going to use anymore. So I'm just, you know, putting it on a, you know, piece of, uh, a, a mat board. Mm hmm he goes, how much is it? <laughs> I said, he totally threw me off. And I said, well, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, and he goes, well, so this is really sort of a document of your palette, isn't mm. it? And I thought, oh, you're right. Hmm. And he said, well, so what, um, when did you start it? And so we go get into the conversation. Well, anyway, it is a documentation of my palette. Right. Uh, this piece took about a year and a half to do just to fill up mm. this mat board. <laughs> and when you look at it, it's interesting because I've got all these interesting patterns going on, you know, and it's very, uh, sort of, it's very low relief, you know, it's like a sculpture almost. Right. You know? And, uh, I mean, it was something I was continuing to do anyway. I just didn't, didn't think about it that way. And mm -hmm. then of course I started thinking about it that way. Right. <laughs> and I started becoming a little bit more formal about how I was applying the paint <laughs> on, you know, on the palette and then eventually, or on the, on the mat board, but then eventually onto either a canvas or a wood panel. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these uh, works, and they're called, it's a series that's called Sound of Color. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of these actually do take several years. It takes several years because it depends on how much I'm painting. Right. Uh, and it depends on how much paint I have left on my palette that I'm not going to use anymore. Mm -hmm. So a lot of artists don't do anything with that. They'll either discard it or, you know, I don't know what they do with it. Right. I found something to do with it. And believe me, it's, it's been very rewarding. Wow. Yeah. That's, cool. That's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to hear a lot of, um, the directions you go are almost like stumbled upon, you know, yeah. it's like, Oh, someone kind of suggested it and I was open to hearing That's right. it, That's right. you know, yeah. which is, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm definitely guilty of kind of trying to, tune everyone out when creating, you know, and uh, trying to focus in on what I'm trying to uh, do. And when people give me, you know, oh, I miss when you did this or whatever, I'm always like, well, I'm, I'm doing this now or, you know, and uh, I don't know, maybe that's a good lesson for me to try to think about for a while is like <laughs> being more open to suggestion. Um, but that's, that's pretty awesome because yeah, a lot of the stuff you're, you, it just seems like you're very open to, you know, letting inspiration or whatever you want to call it kind of jump at you and, and take you down a different path, which I definitely am guilty of not allowing. <laughs> well, you know, it's, what's interesting is <clears throat> what, what I do now is, uh, I'll encourage feedback. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what I mean by that is there are times where I'll do something and I'm just not quite sure. And now with, um, uh, with Instagram, you know, I'll just post it. Mm-hmm. I just want to see what kind of reaction I get. Right. You know, is this something that might, you know, be interesting to people? I mean, mm-hmm. I think I like it, you know, but then when you have that little bit of doubt, right. this might be a good way to just sort of get, you know, what do people think? Right. And, and not to say that that's the reason why I'm going to do this. It's just, it's just a good gauge mm-hmm. for me. And, uh, and I got to tell you, I've, I've done you know, really well with some of the feedback that I've gotten from people. That's uh, awesome. In fact, some of the, um, like the new abstract work mm-hmm. that I do, which is not figurative. Mm-hmm. Um, the first time I did a couple of those, um, and the very first time was back in 2000, about 2015. Mm-hmm. And again, that goes back to seeing the Matisse show. This evolved, this abstract work evolved from the figurative cutout. Mm. As I was cutting out the shapes to put the figure together, I would have these remnants left over Mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what am I going to do with the remnants, uh, because some of them I may not be able to use for, you know, a large part of the anatomy, you know, because my idea was to continue doing more of the figurative uh, cutouts. So I started working with uh, these interesting designs, um, which really sort of, uh, echo mid-century modern right, art, for sure. you know, and I uh, started putting them together and I did a couple of small ones and I put them on Instagram and oh my God, the hits I was getting, I was thinking, <laughs> oh, this is interesting. <laughs> I said, yeah. maybe I should look into this a little bit more. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I did. <laughs> for sure. I'm glad yeah. that I did because um, it's been one of my most successful um, uh, directions in mm. uh, creating art. So, what, so what I'm doing now is um, I'm creating a lot of uh, very, uh, well, a lot of abstract work that is reminiscent of mid-century modern. Mm-hmm. But I'm really, mm-hmm. I don't really want to tag it that, mm-hmm. you know, I, but it, it, a lot of people do because they sort of recognize a lot of that uh, information that they're looking at as, you know, what they've seen in the past. Yeah. And some of that's even coming back, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of the reasons why um, we talked about this earlier, not on the podcast, on, yeah, on the broadcast, but um, one of the reasons uh, I uh, my one of my new works got into the cover of CA Modern Magazine was mm-hmm. because the people that write for that magazine saw my work at the Mexican Museum last year. I had a retrospective at the Mexican Museum mm-hmm. in January mm-hmm. last year. And they saw the abstract work uh, actually at, they didn't see it there. Yes, they did. They saw it there. (laughs) I get mixed up because a lot of people saw it at two different places. But uh, they saw it there and they sought me out uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to do an interview and did. And then, uh, and then, um, selected one of my pieces for their cover and a five page interview. So, uh, yeah, so that new direction with the abstract work, which is something I never thought I'd be doing, mm-hmm. um, is something that has uh, really resonated with me as an artist, something that I love doing because I'm creating the designs first. I'm creating monoprints, mm-hmm. sheets of paper with design and ju- or just plain color, right. and then going in there and just cutting them out, mm-hmm. cutting them out and creating these compositions. Yeah. Um, but- you know, it's interesting for now that you're describing your more abstract work. What's very interesting to me is, is that uh, it kind of reminds me of, um, you know, like the reason people like antiques or whatever is because there's, there's some sort of like feeling that there's a story behind the piece. There's some life behind it. And what's interesting with your abstract work is that it literally is the offcuts of representational work. So it's almost like, like it's negative space that's being utilized. It's like, uh, your abstract work is actually figurative in a weird way, but not, it's like, uh, it, it, you know, it's like, um, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. It's like, there's more life to it than what's actually, there's more story behind that piece, you know, right. with your paint, like your, uh, what you call dollops of paint. Right. 
yeah. there is a story behind it with your um where you're doing even your paper cuts there's a story behind the paper and with you know your abstracted story like paper cuts there's a there's some figurative story behind it it's kind of interesting to, to like have this you know because people you know it's like the whole idea i don't know if i even subscribed to this idea but the whole idea of like objects having that life and you know haunted houses or whatever you you know like these whole like ideas of these things retain something from the past right yeah um, no, that actually you're you're absolutely correct in fact uh one of the reasons, one of the things I questioned myself in doing these these abstract pieces mm -hmm. was, well, why am I doing this? You know, right. where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I grew up in the '60s. Mm -hmm. I grew up during the mid modern or mid century right. okay. modern period. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I remember as a kid, I didn't know much about art, but mm -hmm. I remember as a kid, you know, seeing buildings with these interesting shapes. I remember right. seeing um, on television. You know, um, things like, I don't know, the Jetsons, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or magazines, particularly magazines. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember seeing these particular shapes and colors right. and trying to figure out now where is all this coming from? And, the, and, and you know, it, it, it basically it, it all comes from inside of me. Mm -hmm. And somehow I, I was able to bring it out mm -hmm. and uh, create this work. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so I don't know if we want to segue to uh, mm -hmm. talking about your piece right now. Mm -hmm. Well, we have like two pieces that uh, we wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not familiar with the titles. I tried to find the title of this one. Yeah, th so <clears throat> the one you're pointing out uh, is called Prudence. Prudence? Prudence, mm -hmm. Prudence um, is actually a, uh, a figure model. Uh, and a friend who I've been working with for many, many years since the nineties Oh wow! or, hmm. or maybe early. Yeah, definitely late nineties, early 2000. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably one of the best models I've ever worked with. Um, hmm. uh, she is, uh, uh, uh voluptuous mm -hmm. and she has the confidence that you would not believe as a model. That's she awesome. is. And that's the one thing that I look for when I work with models, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm always working from life. Mm -hmm. So uh, she brings it on. She gives me a lot to work with. And uh, the painting that you're looking at comes from a drawing that I did mm. many years ago. That painting was done in 2009. Mm. But it doesn't look like it was done in 2009, based no. on what you're looking at right now in my studio. No. <laughs> well, so... The drawing was done much earlier than that, and uh, I love that drawing so much. I thought I'm going to do a painting of it, mm -hmm. but as but as uh, you can see, but the audience can't. Uh, it's done in a, you know, a, a very non-representational and very abstract way. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's a figure, right? You know, yeah. The, this is probably for me. It was like a, one of my favorite pieces I think you've created for me. I was like, gosh, there's so much about this piece that I'm really, really into. Uh, <laughs> Do you know that piece sat or was in my flat files for the longest time? Wow. Because it was an experiment. <laughs> it was an experiment. That's not the way I was painting back then. Right. You know, we yeah, talked yeah. about how I was painting earlier. Uh, so it was an experiment. <clears throat> and also I paint generally on canvas or on panel I, I rarely paint on paper right this one is on heavyweight paper mm -hmm. um and you could see in this painting there's on the left side of the painting there's this abstract objects going on right so so back then i was already thinking about form mm -hmm. you know in an abstract way uh in shapes and uh so i was thinking about how how i would incorporate that idea along with the idea of figurative abstraction together. Mm. So I did a few of these and I think uh, the few that I did, the others were sold. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one here I kept, but I kept it in my file and forgot about it for the longest time. Wow. And last year I had a show <clears throat> at Mercury 20. Um, I can't remember can't remember the title, but it was all figurative. But mm -hmm. it was a survey of the figure that I've been working on for years. Mm -hmm. So it had it had a um, 
a, a representation of works from like as early as 2002 t- up to 2018. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, both in painting, printmaking, and drawing. Wow. And uh, w- I came across this piece in my flat file. <laughs> and I thought, I should get this pa- I should get this frame for this show. Mm-hmm. And I'm really glad that I did. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm really happy with it. It's not going to be the way I'll be painting, but you mm-hmm. know, it's basically uh, really the one and only. Wow! Right now, wow, so that's awesome. Yeah, so that's why I'm asking for a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. yeah, justified. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, I just even the I love how like there's like these warm tones and cold tones that play off each other, yes. and mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, there's even like the the like there's this t- the top part there's these abstract like blue that you you kind of like push through this this like a uh, brownish color but it it almost reminds like it it, it almost reminds me of block printing uh-huh. in a way b- because you're almost paying attention to the blue shapes the negative spaces as the almost like as the mark you mm-hmm. know what i mean like sure. like the it's almost like you put I don't know how to explain it, but I remember looking at it and going like, oh, those blue shapes are so interesting. And it's so weird that they're the negative space that they're, and they're the pieces that seem, but when you think about block printing, that's almost kind of how you're working, right? You're, 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 um, the negative space is the image is what's, or like the, the part you're not putting the mark on is what you're focused on. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, well, well, that's great. I mean, I, 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 I didn't think of it of it that way. But right. It's it's really good to hear from somebody else who has you know their own interpretation of For sure. what they're seeing. Yeah. Um, I'm always interested to find out what people are thinking about. You yeah. Know? And, and uh, as as an artist yourself, you know, I think your interest goes even beyond you know just the visual. It right. goes It goes to the how. Yeah. Exactly. You know, how is this done? You yeah. Know, why? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that is definitely what. As far as for me, when I ingest like a painting, it's like the initial thought is like, do I like this or not? And then, then after that, I go like, how did they execute it? From as far as I can figure out, you know. Right. From, uh, and then, yeah, what? Why did they decide to go that route? But yeah, uh, well, you know, there are also um, a, a number of contemporary artists that I was looking at. I'm not going to throw out names or anything because mm-hmm. I'm really bad at that. But uh, <laughs> but there are people that you know I was looking at and just sort of getting ideas and seeing what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And so that's the reason why I said that this particular piece was an experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if you look at that uh, red uh, indication on the bottom there, mm-hmm. you know, I've done that with several of my works. And that all comes from looking at works of Nathan Oliveira. So I will throw mm. a name out, yeah. <laughs> okay. who I really love a lot. I love his work immensely. I, I, I love the entire mm-hmm. Bay Area figurative mm-hmm. movement okay. and the artist at that time. So I, was, I definitely looked at a lot, of, a lot of that work. But there's mm-hmm. a lot of contemporary artists today who are not part of that. Uh, who I was also looking at just to see what they're doing. Mm. You know, they're doing something much different than I than I was at the time, mm. and uh, and I felt like you know I really wanted to just sort of look for something different. Mm. Mm-hmm. This didn't go very far, but I'm sort of glad that it did because um, I like the direction that I'm going with right now. That's awesome. Yeah. And then the second piece is the piece we talked a little bit about earlier, being on the cover of CA Modern. CA Modern magazine, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's it's a man. And then, so this is kind of where the man and the abstract are uh, kind of playing off each other. And Correct. yeah, it almost looks like camouflage. Mm. Yeah. 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 And we talked a little bit earlier how, like, uh, there are, there's like this odd similarity between you and Sergio in a way where mm-hmm. the background and the figure are playing with each other, um, uh, which was kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah, so this is, you said this was a direct, a direction kind of like that you're at right now based off of your past uh, art. This uh, is, this, uh, the piece that we're talking about now is called Tranquility, mm-hmm. or tra- mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Tranquil. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's uh, one of the newest figurative pieces that I've done. Uh, and it was also done for the show, the figurative show that I had last year at Mercury 20. Um, basically, this is an accumulation of everything that I've done. 
with a figure. Mm -hmm. You know, this is basically what it's resulted to, resulted to now. Uh, but going back to Prudence, so that piece was done from a drawing okay. that I still have. Okay. Mm -hmm. This painting, uh, Tranquil, was done from life. Mm. Oh, wow. So the model, so I had the model come here. I had the 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 canvas on my um, on my easel, and I just started drawing mm -hmm. uh, oh. from life. So with that one, I I did document the uh, progression. Mm -hmm. So you you saw that I think yeah. on on Instagram or Facebook one of yeah. those two. Um, the draw I love the drawing, but the mm -hmm. drawing is no more. Right? Yeah. It's in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, yeah, uh, I love the drawing because I love the line work. But mm -hmm. you know, I'm willing to give up that line work in a piece like this because I'm looking for a final product, right. a, a painting based on that line work, that drawing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. I go funny. through a similar thing all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny because even when I was I was talking to my wife about your work, and I was we were talking about that piece in particular and I was like, Oh, I love the drawing so much. Like I almost wish he didn't cover it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it makes sense. There is that as, as far as artists, there's always things you have to kind of sacrifice for the big picture. Well, you know, and that's also why you document. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can also, uh, you know, eventually when the cells, mm -hmm. um, you could always refer to, the documentation of the progress for this piece right. to the collector mm -hmm. right. say this is how this is where it started and mm -hmm. this is where it, where it's ended up mm -hmm. and then you know going further with being published right you know so uh so the process there was uh, my intention was to incorporate these um these shapes mm -hmm. uh designs into the figure mm -hmm. uh wasn't really sure how it was going to work or if it was going to work but again it had to work, mm -hmm. you know. I had to make it work, um, and uh, and then also choosing color, you know, and figuring out. Well, you know, I I'm currently working with blues. I love blue. Mm -hmm. Blue is one of my favorite colors, but I love orange <coughs> right. a lot too. So blue and orange are probably two colors that are probably not used that often together, or maybe mm -hmm. they are. I don't know, but I just <laughs> felt like you know I really want that warm, hot right. color coming through juxtaposed with that really cool calming blue for sure mm -hmm. color you know with the figure in a representational form mm -hmm. but you have to look for it right you know i mean you could see definitely the hat but mm -hmm. you know there are parts of the figure you really have to look at mm -hmm. and one of the things about my work and this has always been um this has always been the case for me is I don't like it when somebody comes into a gallery and sees my work and just goes, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. You know, right. I want them to stand there. I want them to figure out what the heck am I doing? What am I looking at? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons, that's one of the uh, the key things for me that is a success. Hmm. That makes a successful painting. You right. know, you've gotten the attention of that viewer. Right. Yeah, that makes sense, especially nowadays where... Literally, most people in just start on Instagram and flick through it like, uh, right. you know, hours of work as, and they take it for, look at it for a second and yeah, exactly. on to the next thing. <laughs> so, right. yeah, yeah th uh, that is something we've talked about a bit about how do you force the viewer to spend more time looking at work and really thinking about it. Mm. Um, you give them more to look at. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's. Com complicated, complicated for them so they can mm. stand in front of it and, and look and find things. Mm. Yeah. Also, the caption that you put on Instagram, like the words that you go with it, give it some context too. Mm. I think a lot of people kind of underestimate the power of the words that you can put to go with the, the picture too. Right. So, are, you, are you talking about title? Oh, or? not just title, but I mean, talking about on Instagram, like how do you get somebody to, to stop and, and look at your piece so uh -huh. you can also write something interesting to go with it and that yeah. might give people a reason to go back and look at oh okay let me look at this a little bit longer because there's something there's some context that the artist put in it for me for sure so, right yeah yeah right exactly and <clears throat> well in the context for this is you know it's it's uh being a figurative artist pretty mm -hmm. much my entire career and now doing abstract work bringing the two together you know, marrying mm -hmm. the two together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, one question I kind of have randomly uh, uh, is: It seems like you you have a, a good relationships with your art collectors. Uh, is that something you you really focus on curating and paying attention to? Is oh, definitely. Yeah, no, that's my lifeline for sure. Yeah, that's how I that's how I pay bills. Yeah, <laughs> you know how that's how I pay a mortgage. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. I, uh, and, and did that kind of mindset come from working in like the banking industry and realizing that uh, trying to figure out this art world as a business, you know? Right. Um, you know, going to art school, they don't teach you that or mm -hmm. maybe they do no. now. I, I, they didn't when I went to school. Mm -hmm. Uh, the fortunate thing for me is I came from a business background. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I managed, uh, you know, the units that I was with, mm -hmm. uh, in banking. So I took whatever information I had there and brought it to my business, my art business. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is an art business. Right. It has to be an art business For if sure. you want to make it work. Yeah. You know, you can't just sit there and paint and think that, oh, everyone's going to like it. Right. There's a lot that goes behind it. You know, yeah. the, the I mean, preparation, the, 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 the paperwork, the marketing, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. So yeah, th that's always, because for me, I work a full time job, and I'm, you know, on the the the, the full time artist is always the goal. But I'm in no rush because th the aspect I feel the least confident in is that aspect is the is the how do I literally make enough money to live off of doing paintings and and uh, you know uh, it seems like for me collectors I've, I've talked to a couple other artists where that is a huge important thing you know galleries are great but surviving off of you know them alone is pretty much impossible forget it yeah yeah i mean unless you've got 10 or 15 calories yeah you know and that's all you're focusing on mm -hmm. and yeah you could do it you right. know but they also have to be very productive yeah meaning they've got to sell your work right mm -hmm. Um, and there's just so much competition out there, right. you know, not only in galleries, but art, but get artists trying to get into galleries. For sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, that's not my focus. Yeah. I, you know, I don't actually have major representation, mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't had to need, I have really had no need for it. That's awesome. That's well, great. Yeah. Not, not last year. <laughs> hopefully it'll happen this, hopefully I can continue that this year. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, <clears throat> there's certain things that, that have happened for me in my career that's really boosted my uh, presence. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what that was, was when I had my retrospective at last year at the Mexican Museum. Hmm. When I had that, uh, I things started turning. Hmm. My name got out there. People were seeing my work who had never seen my work before at the museum. Mm -hmm. I was getting calls. I was making sales. I, it was just, I was getting um, uh, calls and emails from people who wanted interviews from me. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. was, you know, the more you do that, the more you get out there, the more people know who you are, the mm -hmm. more eyes that see your website. Mm -hmm. You know, the more people who contact you, it, it's, it's, it's one of those domino effects. Right. That's a, that's awesome. No. Yeah. So the key is get a retrospective at a museum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put that it's on my to-do list. Yeah. Easy. easy, easy <laughs> yeah. But that was, but that, that was an accident. Right. That oh. for me, that, that situation was a, a wonderful, a uh, great opportunity, which, Getting the had, retrospective, you mean? Yes. Uh, I had no idea that this was going to happen, hmm. and neither did the museum. Wow. Really? Huh. They stumbled upon my work at the show that I had of, of all abstract work hmm. in 2017. And, uh, and the show is around, I think it was around November. Yes, around November. And uh, my retrospective was in January of 2018. Mm. they wow. needed to fill a spot because mm. the artist that was originally going to be shown could not show because mm. of an earthquake in Mexico. Oh, oh wow. That right. like 10 point, whatever it put them in a jam and huh. they were looking. Oh, wow. And, oh, and so talk about, well, unfortunate for the artists in right. Mexico, but you know, for me, it was like, I, the fortunate that they saw my work. Yeah. And uh, was... they got to they got to talking about um we got to talking about the abstract work at the gallery. Mm. 
but the the main curator said, well, I also saw some figure work in your website. Talk, talk to me about that. And so I did, and mm-hmm. he came, and he selected all this work. And But at the time, I didn't wasn't thinking about retrospective, and I don't think he was either. Hmm. And uh, I filled up the entire museum. It's That's awesome. the three three huge galleries. You know, it was wow. it's not that big of a museum, but mm. I filled it up. Hmm. That's awesome. It, you know, like there is like um, this this talk about like it was an accident, but at the same time, there is this you were prepared to do that. You right. know, there was yeah. like <laughs> like. Like timing seems to be very important in life, you know, but at the same time, it's like you also have to have the ability once that timing comes right. to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. So, mm-hmm. well, yeah. I, I, yeah, you're right. You know, I actually, I actually have history. Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know so, you know, yeah, I'm, it's probably like when you the, I'm probably one of the older <laughs> artists that you've interviewed so far. <laughs> yeah. When you said that they're like, talk to me about your figurative work, you had an answer for that. That's right. probably really important. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like you guys are interview- interviewing me now, like, you know, figure and now abstract, mm-hmm. the same question they have. You know, right. You mm-hmm. see your figure, but you're doing this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, to me, that's that's just interesting. It's always interesting to me when people are able to kind of have different sections of what they're creating and, you know, they might melt together and they might have their own little universes or whatever, but it, it seems, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like like a relief or something like, like, uh, enjoyable. I don't know how to explain it. Just like, uh, to have that many different outlets of creating to me is like, Oh, that seems great. I need to figure that out maybe a bit, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm always going back and forth. I'm also like, I should focus on this and put all my attention and, you know, but yeah, it's whatever. Well, you know, <clears throat> I, um, I get, I get the question from people, would you ever have a block? You know, do you ever go through periods where you just don't know what to do next? Mm-hmm. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see why. Right. You know, I can go any direction. I mm-hmm. can go, well, I'll just work on figure painting. Or yeah. I'll go to a drawing session. Or I'll do my printmaking. Yeah. You know, or I'll do my collage work. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I've got so many different projects that I can work on. I literally work on at least five projects all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I, I don't understand that either i'm i wish there was more time in, in like my i'm like i hope i can lift at 300 so i can finish all these ideas i have <laughs> yeah um the other, yeah that 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 it, to me is a weird situation I, I don't know how you go do you do you take notes or how do you go about saving your ideas because i know for me it, it's just some random notepad on my iphone where it's like this idea this idea this idea this idea just all in your head, it's huh? All in my head. Wow. But but sometimes I don't remember them, mm. you know, and I should be writing things down, but a lot right. of times I don't. What I do write down and I but I've stopped doing it. <clears throat> but for years I was writing down possible names for uh exhibitions. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, wow. if I was gonna huh. do an exhibition, oh this is this would be a good title for it. Right. You know, <laughs> so I have this whole list and I I can look at that list right now and think and probably delete more than half of them right. making other these are stupid titles yeah you know, i would never use these mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah I, I, the other day i was just looking through my ideas and there was one and i read it and i was like i have no idea what that's what about <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so stupid but in the time i thought of it i was like oh that might be something interesting to do <laughs> right so um yeah but that's interesting that you just have them in your head because yeah. that's my fear is always forgetting well but that was my fear for a while too. But then mm-hmm. I, then I've just decided, you know, I don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't want to do that actually, right. because I really would rather have it come out of me just either remembering mm-hmm. or somehow subconsciously, subconsciously it's going to come out of me, right? you know? And, uh, cause I want it to be my own, mm-hmm. you know? And even though, you know, it's because I've seen other works and there's maybe some, reference Mm -hmm. you know but you could you wouldn't know right you know uh i again my the idea is making keeping my own voice for sure you know yeah Yeah, another thing that's interesting is when you went to the um matisse gallery or the gallery that's showing matisse or uh that um 
that seeing it in person was such a big influence. You know, mm-hmm. it goes back to what we were saying a little bit earlier about people in ingesting most art through Instagram. It's like there is that importance of seeing some works in person and, you know, understanding it on a different level, you know, especially you, you paint at such a big scale in some instances that, uh, you know, a two by two screen or whatever it is, three by, I don't know how big the screen is, but you, you just, it just doesn't do it justice. It, it doesn't. And, and I think it's true. For, I think it's true though, for all work, whether mm-hmm. it's small work or large, you right. know, the screen doesn't do it justice until you actually see the physical work. Yeah. Um, so going to museums and going to galleries mm-hmm. is really important, right. you know, and, and I, I say that like I go all the time. I don't, <laughs> yeah. you know, but it is. And I used to, uh-huh. but I find that, you know, a lot of times I just don't have the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's a show I want to go see and I'm like I'm really excited about it, but you know, I'll see it, you know, later it's right. going to end in three months. So I've got plenty of time and then three <laughs> yeah. months have gone and I'm thinking, Oh, I just missed it. I hate uh-huh. that. Yeah. <laughs> that happens way too often. <laughs> I know it's, it's, but it, yeah, it, one of the things for, at least for me as an artist was I'm so used to going to shows that I'm a part of and not going to other shows. So whenever me and my wife get the chance to go to shows that we're not a part of, it's so nice because we also don't have to talk to people if we don't want, you know, right. we, we can just kind of enjoy the art, enjoy if, if a friend's in the show or something, we can talk to them, but there's, there isn't that, uh, added responsibility of, you know, communicating with people ingesting your art or whatever, which I, don't get me wrong. I don't mind that, but sometimes it is nice to just be a fly on the wall or something well, like that. Well, okay. That's fine. But you know, that is part of the process, I know. you know, I mean, if you, if, if you're serious about what you're doing, yeah. you want people to know what's going on in your head, right. at least to some extent, yeah. you know, if they've got that much interest that they're going to approach you and they want to talk to you. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah. be a fly on the wall in your own show. No, no, never that. Yeah, I'm, I'm the drunk guy. You scream me at the, <laughs> like, get away from the bar. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah, that that is um, pretty cool. Um, how are we doing on time? We still have plenty of time. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't, the um, well, I don't know if you want to go into the uh, random two questions you have. Oh sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if we're ready for them, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Sergio has these like questions he asked uh, all our guests. Uh, we did. Did we ask Trackle? Yeah. Yeah, we did. <laughs> might have heard the two questions. Uh, so, yeah, it started out, um, we would ask our guests who their top five dead or alive artists are. And um, it started to morph into being just now uh, we want to know who your top five living artists are. Uh, partly because we're getting kind of the same answers, but I don't know, your work is, you might have different influences, so it might not be the same five uh, dead artists that everybody else is influenced by. So I kind of just want to leave it up to you if you want to um, um, talk about which five artists that you're really into right now, or um, that maybe if you wanted to also like the people who influence you as you were um learning to be an artist. All right. Yeah. Well, so that goes back to going to art school. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, uh, I mentioned two already, actually three, mm-hmm. but uh, two for sure. Uh, Lucian Freud for one, mm-hmm. who okay. I discovered yeah. in art school. Uh, Paul Cadmus is another one. Mm-hmm. More, more for drawing, mm-hmm. not so much for painting, mm-hmm. although he painted as well. Um, and, uh, oh, Egon Schiele. Oh, sure. Yeah. Egon mm-hmm. Schiele. Mm-hmm. He's probably the, you know, my number one. Mm. Awesome. Um, yeah. With my drawings, um, and it's not something that uh, I was trying to mimic or achieve, but with my drawings, um, when I show them to collectors, p- people who know who Egon Schiele is, not everybody does, mm-hmm. um, they'll make a reference to, oh, you know, do you know Egon Schiele? Mm-hmm. Work? And I said, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. He says, well, I see a little bit of Sheila here, or, mm. you know, maybe uh-huh. the hands or right. the feet or something, you know, uh, or toulouse Lautrec. Mm-hmm. you know, those, okay. you know, those kind yeah. of people. So I we're talking about older <laughs> artists here. <laughs> but, you know, those are the ones that I was looking at, you know. Mm-hmm. But even going further than that, you know, because I, I just didn't really know much about 
art and art history. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started art school, you know, I was really into the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. really into Michelangelo. I was mm -hmm. really into Raphael and then learning all the other uh, old masters. Right. You know, particularly the, the, the drawings. Mm -hmm. um, not, mm -hmm. so, not so much the painting so much, but more the drawings. Mm -hmm. I was really into the drawings. Awesome. Yeah, yeah that makes mm -hmm. sense because all the people you... Um, that you just mentioned their work is so focused on line and not just like line as a, like a delicate thing their line is very forceful a lot of mm -hmm. them as well like sheila and, and um even uh latrec to a certain extent mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. some um yeah a mix of like fluidity and and um strength in their drawing right. so yeah i could see that how that comes through in your work okay. yeah and and the and the others that uh that i looked at for many years and i really haven't referenced much to it even now but uh but you know the bay area figurative artists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know i looked at a lot of their work uh when i got an opportunity whether it was in a museum or in a gallery show but definitely books mm -hmm. you know, definitely books um now those are figurative artists that i'm talking about mm -hmm. you know but now I'm doing abstract work too, right. and, you know, and, and the type of work that I'm doing in the way of abstraction, who, who do I look at? Um, I, I'm really looking at everybody who's doing work that's either similar or just doing abstract work. I, I've mm -hmm. gotten this affinity for abstract work. Yeah. You know, I can't seem to get enough of it. Huh. But uh, two names do come to mind um, when I think about, oh, and Matisse also, of course. Mm. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but uh, two names come to mind, and um, w one of the artists is no longer here, Rex Ray. Rex I don't Ray. know if you know. Don't know that one. Oh, you should I'm... know Rex Ray. <laughs> Bay Area artist. <laughs> okay. He passed away about three, four years ago, I, mm. I believe. Uh, I've always loved his work. And uh, 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 my work is not anywhere near his work mm -hmm. at all. Uh, but, um, but there are certainly some, I think, some possible references mm -hmm. uh, to what I'm doing based on what he has done in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Um, and this other artist by the name of James Kennedy, mm. uh, he actually is, um, represented by Dobie Chadwick. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, this guy is awesome. <laughs> uh, and, and his work is probably even more so, I think, uh, I look at his work probably even more so than I do Rex Ray's work. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, he's, he just worked really interesting with shapes, you know, shape and color. Mm -hmm. Uh, his colors can be very subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, or they, you know, can be, they can be loud, or, or but mostly subtle. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of uh, abstract, those would be the two that I would probably look at, at least now. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but like I said, I look at a lot of abstract work. I yeah. look to see what people are doing, <clears throat> particularly my contemporaries, mm -hmm. and particularly on Instagram. Right. I love going to Instagram just to see what pops up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. When you look at the abstract art, um, do you, is there anything in particular that you tend to fixate a little bit more on, like shape and color, for example, and that sort of thing? You know, I tend to fixate more on um, uh, work that's that's retro. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's really what I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know, and <laughs> and there are artists that, uh, that I've sort of keyed into on Instagram that are doing some really interesting works. Don't ask me about names because I can't remember, but <laughs> it's really more visually of what I'm looking at, mm -hmm. right. you know, and, uh, and that's what's retained in, up here. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of that direction is, is really what I focus on, but mm -hmm. I look at a lot of abstract work. Yeah. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Abstract expressionism is another area that I like a mm -hmm. lot, you know. <clears throat> yeah, I'm starting Pollock, to look at that more. Yeah, Pollock for one. Um, <laughs> you know, very abstract expression. <laughs> yeah, he gets brought up a lot on our <laughs> podcast, but probably for different reasons. <laughs> well, I'm, probably, yeah, I'm not his biggest fan. <laughs> well, it, I'm not saying that I'm a fan of his work necessarily, but I, I mean, I like, I like what he's doing, mm -hmm. and and the reason I say that is, you know, there's uh, some work in my portfolio, and I don't know if you, if you've uh, looked at it, but uh, this mm -hmm. is also very abstract. It's uh, it's work like okay. yeah, those yeah. paper cutouts. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. sure. Very abstract paper right. cut shapes that uh -huh. are one on top of another. Right. Yeah. So I've done several of those, and uh, those have been very successful. Mm. You know, and they're tedious to do. <laughs> they're 
there are a lot of you know Pollock would you know work very quickly with mm -hmm. his paint when you know on the floor right where I'm actually taking one little piece at a time mm -hmm. and mounting it on this panel yeah and literally each piece it's not like I'm throwing it on the panel and, right. and gluing it down right I'm actually meticulously selecting each piece and sometimes having to cut them clean them up or something and then placing them and then creating the composition mm -hmm. Hmm. yeah so the biggest one i've done is a 48 by 48 and um, um those you... to me would probably reference more back to that period mm -hmm. the abstract expressionist right now that again is also uh a uh, an interesting um accident because again it's going back to my remnants figuring out what am i going to do with all this stuff right? yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's awesome the uh yeah th there is this interesting thing uh that i've been thinking about about well, it seems like what the, the younger you are as an artist the less you're into abstract work I, at least for me that's how it's been and i've noticed for a lot of people that um you know the, 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 their art will go from being more representational to slowly evolving into more abstract or or you know a combination of both and whatever and and i've been trying to figure out why that is if it's this natural just kind of uh i remember i was talking to sergio about it mm -hmm. like is it where you you're trying to pinpoint the things that you enjoy most about art and, you know, maybe brushstroke work or something like that being something that is very pleasing to you. And the less you're trying to focus on things that, I, I don't know, I've, I've, been, I've been trying to like bounce this idea in my head about why, because for me, there is this uh, slow gain of love for certain things of abstract work like i know uh mark english um is an artist that i'm really really into right now and he's uh you know he started off as very classical like very uh representational work and kind of transitioned and it's like this and he still comes back and forth but it's this interesting you know in between that i really love kind of like you know how you're combining the two right that uh um, I don't know. Well, just... well, you know, uh, Picasso mm -hmm. was like that. You right. know, the guy could draw. Mm -hmm. The guy could paint. Right. You know, and then he went very abstract, right. you know, and his work, I mean, the guy's amazing. Yeah. Well, so Picasso is another one that I looked at a lot, too. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of definitely. people who know a little about art history mm -hmm. don't know that. Right. I mean, he could actually really draw, right? Yeah. You know, beautifully, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and and the guy did everything, right. you know. He did painting, he did drawing, he did sculpture, he did ceramics. Right. He did, I mean, he mm -hmm. did block printing, sure, incredible block printing, mm -hmm. etchings. I mean, you right. know, you name it, he did it. Yeah, very proficient, it's very mm -hmm. proficient. And um, you know, I'm not trying to follow that track, but right. you know, in, in a way, that's really sort of what I've done you mm -hmm. know where i've gone from the traditional figure drawing mm -hmm. and painting to what i'm currently doing now which right. but i'm still trying to keep that sense of you know what i've done in the past bringing it now to today right yeah yeah also we haven't really talked about your i mean we have talked about your figure drawing, we haven't talked about them as their own works of art but those are also one of my favorite things you do. The, there was like this exaggeratedness to your drawings that I love. Uh, and I don't, did you, is that just natural that you developed over time or? Um, yeah, it was definitely something I developed over time because mm -hmm. if you remember in the beginning of the interview, right. going to art school, you know, basically slap my hand saying, you got to loosen up right. you know, <laughs> and draw larger. Mm. Um, so once I started drawing larger, that's when, I loosened up, right? And uh, and when I started drawing the figure, I was working with uh, with uh, graphite. Mm -hmm. I I don't work with graphite anymore unless I'm doing just a very you know simple sketch for some project. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally, it's uh, with uh, Conte. Mm -hmm. I okay. love working with Conte, and uh, and sticks, mm -hmm. and not necessarily Conte pencils, but sometimes I'll work with those as well. 
Um, so like a sharpened stick of like compressed charcoal, basically. Yeah, yeah. you know, I'll use I love those. A, I'll yeah. use an exacto knife just mm-hmm. to sharpen it, get mm-hmm. it, get a, a nice, uh, you know, tip on mm-hmm. it, and then I'll use that. And the way I approach the figure when I'm drawing, especially if it's a timed mm-hmm. drawing, um, gestures are w- one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, well, audience can't see, but behind you, there's a drawing there of a male nude. Right. So that's, I think, like a seven minute drawing mm-hmm. or 10 mm-hmm. minute drawing. Um, one of the things that I don't like doing and I don't like to see in a drawing, whether it's me or someone else is that they belabored that line, mm. you know, is where they've just like been very careful mm. about making sure that it's the right line for that particular part of the anatomy. Mm-hmm. I approach it by just attacking it. Right. I go into that piece of paper. I look at the model for a few seconds first, and I visualize what I'm going to put on the paper and where do I start. Mm. I start with the head, but the head is just a shape, Mm -hmm. just a real quick shape. Mm -hmm. And then I'll start blocking out the figure very quickly and then go right back in very quickly and start drawing uh, the the permanent line, basically. Mm -hmm. And I weigh the amount of pressure on my... Uh, on my my uh, Conte mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. by if if so when you're a lot of people when you're drawing the figure you model the figure by adding in shadow and so mm-hmm. forth I don't like I don't I don't like doing that I would prefer letting the line do that right. let the line create the volume of the figure that's what I go for mm-hmm. so and that's and by doing that there's two things it's about the amount of um, pressure mm-hmm. you're applying to your to your uh uh conte and 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 not necessarily thinking about well i gotta i gotta go light here i gotta go heavy there just doing it just mm-hmm. do it you know and whether you whether you come out with a good drawing or not is not really the point it's about the practice of drawing from life it's about what you're seeing mm-hmm. it's about the time and what you put on paper, you know, and sometimes you get something great and sometimes you don't. For sure. Or mostly yeah. you don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. It, the, uh, w- w- you know, with your work going all these different directions, for the future, do you ever see yourself going to like sculpting or anything like that? Or have you tried that at all? I, I did. I actually took a sculpting class in uh, art school mm-hmm. and I didn't like it. Okay. But, you know, I didn't like doing monoprinting either when I was in school. <laughs> and what am I doing now? A right. lot of monoprinting. Huh. Uh, the thing is, I just don't have the time. Right. I literally have no time to add anything more to my schedule. Sure. And it's probably space. Oh, well, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Space is another issue right now. This uh. used to be a big studio for me when I first <laughs> moved in here, thinking, how am I going to fill this place? Well, I have. Yeah. You know, I'm just yeah. way too crowded in here with furniture and flat files and easels and this press. And, yeah. yeah I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. just a lot. Yeah. You do have this amazing press here, which, you know, for anyone who's doing any block prints is probably like a dream come true. So that's, mm-hmm. that's, I mean, you told us earlier that this is a huge financial, um, uh, you know, investment mm-hmm. for your art, but it, it definitely seems like it's paying off even with your abstract stuff and everything you're using it it seems like a ton so that's awesome yeah yeah it's uh, uh it's it's a good investment for mm-hmm. anyone who is serious about printmaking mm-hmm. and if you have the space and if you have the money to right. to pay yeah. for it yeah. uh, but you know it pays itself mm-hmm. it pays itself by you know uh selling your prints mm-hmm. eventually right with those uh, how do you do a specific number of run like for each print? Uh, I yes, I do. Uh, I try not to go too high mm-hmm. because uh, most of the time I don't do the entire run mm-hmm. all at once, mm. mainly because of time and also because of pa- the cost of paper. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially now because I'm working really big. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one I showed you earlier. Mm-hmm. It's a very abstract figurative piece. Uh, there's two of them, actually. And uh, um, they are, uh, uh, in terms of paper, very costly. So mm. I, I just I just print enough that I have enough of an inventory that I can show. And when I that, that inventory reduces, then I'll do another maybe five or ten. Yeah. But generally, my 
for these large ones that I'm working on right now, I think the addition is 15. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, me, me and Sergey, we've talked about it because I'm, I'm not going to do, I'm going to do, start doing, I think, Gicle prints, you know. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying printing it out with a computer or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Um, but we've had this discussion about just prints and how you keep some sort of value to them and limiting the amount seems to be a good way. I mean, there's no comparison f- of those prints compared to a block print where there is this physical aspect to it and this, you know, handmade uh, right. property to it. Right. Uh, but, but that is, yeah, 15 seems like a good number, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the thing about G clay prints, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I've had uh, many people ask me if I could have, if they can have a print of mm-hmm. a particular piece. Right. And uh, I, I, I don't do that. Mm-hmm. I don't do that because it's it's not worth my time. Right. And, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of times they're thinking about a little 8 by 10 you know, Right. You know, and if I'm going to do a print of this, I'm going to do a print. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm gonna, mm-hmm. it's going to be a sizable print. Mm-hmm. But it won't be cheap because I don't right. do that. You know, I'd have to have it done by somebody else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm having you a know. weird deja vu moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, and it's it's okay. I mean, Gicle prints. I mean, that's a lot of people. That's all they can afford, for sure. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, it's really sort of a, it's really a compliment when somebody wants to have your piece, but they just right. can't afford the original. You know, so, yeah. So the next step would be, well, do you do Gicles? Right. And I I personally myself do not do Gicles. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's that's always the dilemma is because art is so expensive. Do you know? Because I've I don't think I've ever done them, but. There is this side of me that like wishes people that, you know, have smaller funds could, you know, get some sort of version of what I'm creating. It also goes back to the whole like trying to curate collectors. You know, it's like buy something small and hopefully that becomes something bigger and bigger um, kind of uh, model of, you know, dipping. Because for me, when I was a kid, it was always like, or when I was younger, if I'd buy something, it might be like an art t-shirt or something like that you know and that was like the show my love for artists i liked or a print and right yeah well one of the things about selling art Mm -hmm. uh and also one who's a painter and a printmaker uh prints are obviously a lot less expensive Mm -hmm. and so they're a lot more approachable to um a a larger mass of people Mm -hmm. so uh so i can offer that right you know but i can't offer uh, a print of a painting in a woodblock from a painting. Right. And if I did, it would be, it would look totally different, mm-hmm. but the reference is the painting, okay. you know? And so that's something that I can offer. If I, if I have something available like that, mm-hmm. um, I have a large collection of uh, print prints, both in, uh, in basically mono prints and also block printing, mm-hmm. mostly, wood, mostly woodblock. Um, but I don't promote it as much as I used to, because mm-hmm. uh, what I'm finding is that people want the original, mm-hmm. and so that's where most of my focus is is doing the one of one of a kind piece. Right. Yeah. So yeah. the printmaking that I'm doing now is only because I'm creating inventory to do these cutouts, these paper cutouts. Huh. Hmm. One thing I've always been curious about, and maybe it's just because I don't understand. It very much is a. What's the advantage of doing a mono print versus like a of any other type of print? Uh, well, the advantage there, <clears throat> excuse me, is that it's one of one, right? So, uh, and it's it's you could sort of look at it as being a painting and a print all in one, uh-huh. and uh, so you can charge more for it, uh-huh. mm-hmm. and uh, and it won't take you as long to do. It, it wouldn't take you as long to do a monoprint as it would to do an edition of prints. Uh-huh. Okay, so. Right. But I uh, guess maybe because, yeah, I, I almost look at, like, why not just do a painting and, rather than a, a monoprint? Um, oh, because it's a process. It's a printmaking process, and it's okay. a unique way of creating a different, uh, it's a unique way of creating art that's that's done 
not using a paintbrush hmm. okay. necessarily. I mean, you can use a paintbrush in monoprenin as well. Uh-huh. You know, if you want to get that that the you know the the strokes involved in uh, in the actual work, you can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, but you're not physically painting the monoprint. You're actually painting plexiglass. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. To transfer it to the paint or to transfer to the paper. Right. Yeah. For some reason, that's really hard for me to wrap my head around. <laughs> Maybe because I'm just so used to painting on canvas or, or like having that painting be the thing that you end up putting on a wall rather than like going through this extra step of uh, putting it through a press. Mm. So, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and the way I, the way I work with monoprints is uh, it's not necessarily just a one run pull through the press. Okay. It's multiple runs. Multiple multiple runs because I'm working multicolor, okay. And you can do multicolor in one run as well, but hmm. layering is really what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, layering that then will create another color on uh-huh. top of it. Hmm. And and or <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm incorporating maybe um, a woodcut, okay, along hmm. with stenciling, you know, and you know, and then eventually finalizing the one of one of a kind piece. Got so it. it's it's for me it's a process for a lot of people who do mono printing or monotype, um, it's a one pull process, mm-hmm. you know. But for me, it's not. I do multiple runs. Yeah, maybe I hadn't heard of doing like multiple runs of one print like that. But yeah, that that does start to make more sense now. Oh, now you're accepting it, Sergio. So <laughs> how I'm high? A, of you. I'm a tough customer. <laughs> you are. <laughs> I'm just so a snobby high and painter. Mighty on his hill. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't know if I accept that. <laughs> okay, maybe I accept it now. <laughs> yeah, you're going to go home and he's going to say, I don't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> Still not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, first of all, if, if you're creating art, you're deciding to put a ton of labor and work into something that technically probably isn't necessary <laughs> to do you know like right uh, no one needs artwork i mean in a way every, i think that's not true but in a way it's not like a like a chair or something you know what i mean yeah uh, uh but, yeah i'm talking trash about the thing i love doing <laughs> <laughs> right but, but you, you know what i mean like, so, i think so, you, i think you do need artwork and a chair together so you could sit Right. And look at that artwork. <laughs> That's correct. Right. It's even like, um, but but what I mean is like, as an artist, you're kind of signing up to struggle a bit in life, you know, to go like a route that isn't easy. So it doesn't, it, to me, it makes sense if, if there's a process that is literally working on something that maybe is an easier route. It's like, yeah, if anyone's going to do it, that's an artist. <laughs> we, we love that, you know, it's the we love to do things in a way that seems to be hard you know uh yeah it is it's very hard yeah <clears throat> it's very hard it's very hard to start as right. an artist you know it's For not sure. something easy at all yeah uh i mean you're lucky if you graduate from art school and a gallery picks you up right you know, and they start selling your work mm-hmm. i mean how often does that happen right. didn't happen to me all right you know, I started, I started off by showing my work on the street, mm. you know, doing these little rinky-dink uh, street fairs, mm. you know, and uh, lugging my work out there. But it wasn't work like this, you know, it was mm. small prints or little paintings, right. you know, but I was getting my, I had to get my work out. <clears throat> and that's the thing about art school. I didn't know the business side of it, you know, and mm-hmm. how do you, how do you approach a gallery? How do you get your work out there? For and sure. when I moved back, to California, I had to find a way to get my work out there. And right. so that's what I did. I didn't know any other way. And I didn't think I was ready for galleries. And I know I wasn't. My work mm. wasn't, you know, wasn't ready for uh, for that type of venue yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew that. Because, uh, again, I hadn't really developed my voice. I was just getting started. So mm. I had to find a way of getting it out there. And, uh, you know, it was very humbling to mm. do that. But I had to do something, and uh, it's progressed from there. Mm. And now I just create art here in the studio. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. And get it out and, you know, get ready for shows. And, you know, the big one coming up, 
you know, in February next month you know, right. in yeah. LA, awesome. the startup art fair. Yeah, That's for sure. a big one. Yeah. Anyone in LA, go check it out. <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. do. Yeah. yeah. When, I, I'm in room three something, 325, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, you were telling us about that a little earlier. That sounded pretty cool. The, um, uh, uh, what is it called again? Startup Art it's Fair? It's called the Startup Art Startup. Fair, and it started here in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, this will be the fifth art fair mm-hmm. that, I, uh, that I'm going to be doing with them. Mm-hmm. Or, or I should I should say that I was selected to do, because mm-hmm. you have to apply for it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's juried by um, art uh, collectors, uh, curators, uh, consultants, mm-hmm. and, gallerists, uh, people who write about, about art. So there's a panel of, uh, of judges that go through all of the um, uh, applications mm-hmm. and up to about 40 to 40, 40 to 50 artists get selected and each artist or, or um, if it's a couple uh, of artists that are applying together will, will be assigned a room and uh, that room is your gallery. Mm-hmm. You create your own gallery space that's awesome out of a, i like that yeah. out of a room in a hotel yeah. and in uh, la it'll be in uh, in venice and uh, the hotel is the kenny hmm. hotel yeah, it sounds like a great idea because i think one of the interesting or one of the tough things with artists sometimes is is figuring out who's purchasing your your paintings sometimes galleries like to hold on to that info mm-hmm. and yes they do and uh, <laughs> And so, you know, having an event like that where you get to directly meet collectors seems like a great opportunity. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's a great way to meet them, talk to them. You know, they they discover you for mm-hmm. the first time, or maybe there are people that follow you that right. you know will come to see what you're showing at the fair, or whatever fair you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and you you retain that information in your mailing list. So you right. always keep them up to date when you're getting ready to do the next big event. Yeah. Uh, and you're right about galleries. Galleries, a lot of galleries don't give you uh, the color. I, there's, there's a lot of people that I have no idea who own my paintings right. because they were sold through a gallery. Mm-hmm. Uh, those galleries are no longer around. And mm-hmm. so I don't, and I don't have any idea who, who owns them, mm-hmm. which is, yeah. you know, pisses me off a little bit because I should know. For right? sure. You know, um, so, but, uh, but most galleries now I think are a little bit better about that. You know, you just have to ask for it. Mm. I I think a lot of them won't offer the information, but if you ask for it, uh, most of them will probably give you that information. In fact, I think they should Mm -hmm. give you that information since, you know, if you're going to have a retrospective, you want to know where it's at in case you want to, you know, ask for it back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. But, uh, Uh, yeah, you know, so being part of the business of art is, is, is that process of, uh, knowing who the buyers are, but then on the other hand is then doing the paperwork. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the part that I hate the most, but Mm -hmm. you know, you gotta do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Taxes and inventory and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. The stuff us artists hate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It would be nice to just paint and draw and not have to deal with that stuff at all how do i get there uh which probably brings us to your second question sergio yeah exactly (laughs) oh we're still on the first (laughs) that was just a really long answer first one yeah (laughs) but uh yeah the second question is uh what what i call uh david cho money (laughs) so yeah what you would do with uh 200 million dollars for your art or as an artist yeah as an artist um, what I would do with it? Yeah. yeah. 200 million. Wow. For sure. Pay someone to do your taxes and all that stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. And hire assistants. <laughs> yeah. Totally. For sure. You know, pay off my mortgage, uh, <laughs> pay off my family's mortgages, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pay off my friend's mortgages. Okay. So start buying my art. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, what, oh, you know, I would definitely, uh, donate a lot of that money to art causes and also Mm -hmm. to other causes that I, that, um, that I like to donate to when I have, you know, a little extra money, Mm -hmm. uh, particularly to, uh, uh, like animal control. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then like, you know, and then recently like the fires, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, like I, I just had a, um, an open studios in December Mm -hmm. 
here at the studio. And uh, one of the things I was promoting is, um, you know, you buy my art, I donate 5% of my sales mm. towards the Northern California fires. Mm -hmm. So I was able to donate money based on my sales for that two day weekend. Mm. Nice. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. Cause I mean, we, Santa Rosa had that fire mm, last year. Mm -hmm. And, Napa Valley. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. and, there is something where you almost feel like you don't know if people uh, that are outside of the the devastating area really understand the devastation that happens in those areas, you know? So that's cool. Uh, I mean, you guys probably got plumes of smoke headed your way when that happened. We did. Uh, oh, tons. Yeah. yeah. Just stayed indoors, keep the doors closed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Is there anything uh, artistic wise you would mm -hmm. you would uh, pursue that you you might not be able to based off of money restraints or anything like that? Hmm. Artistic wise. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Any yes, <laughs> travel <laughs> yeah, to all the major museums in the world. <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and enjoy the fine food. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> fine food, that's an art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be cool. Uh, nice. Awesome. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, we're nearing two hours. Uh, uh, it, we'll post the images of your pieces on our that we talked about and uh, on our social media and at you so people can find your work and see what we're talking about. Um, and yeah, and what's your website? Just so people uh, know. Yeah, the website is F Reyes Art, okay. F R E Y E S A R T dot com. Nice. Awesome. And then uh, are you showing in the Bay Area anytime soon? Um, oh, yeah, I am actually. Uh, a show that opens next week at Mercury 20 here oh, in wow, Oakland. Okay. <laughs> it's called Self Portraits in the Age of Selfies. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. And in fact, I posted uh, my my piece on Instagram, mm -hmm. and it's uh, titled Morning Hair, I Don't Care. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the self portrait? That's that? the self portrait okay. that'll be in the show. Awesome. Right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Great. Uh, awesome. So, yeah, check your. Everyone check his work out. Uh, I really love the work. Um, I'm also a big fan of line work, so mm -hmm. that's like my jam. Uh, and, uh, yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, um, please rate and review us. <laughs> yeah, we got a, yeah, we got a lot of great reviews. Yeah. So it, it, actually, the nice little side benefit of that for us is that we get to see what or and read what people are responding to about the podcast. Yeah. And how they interpret <laughs> Yeah, what we do out here. Yeah, so. we'd never know because we're so. <laughs> we're like, do they hate us? Uh, <laughs> but I guess not. <laughs> uh, so yeah, please rate and review our podcast and subscribe if you're not subscribed. All of this stuff helps us grow the show. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and if you're still listening, fuck off. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>